Hello and welcome to this very special conversation with a very special person brought to you by the world's second oldest cricket club CCFC in partnership with the Bengal Heritage Foundation of London. Michael Holding was not just whispering death. He was truly the Rolls Royce of fast bowling. He's someone who has been a legend when he played the game and now his voice resonates well and truly beyond the boundary and his recent views on race and the Black Lives Matter movement has struck a chord across the world. We're joined today by the one and only Michael Holding. Thanks very much, Michael, for joining us here on this very special show. Thank you. My pleasure, Rajiv. I'm glad to be with you. You know, uh, let's start with that video, that very powerful video, which has gone crazily viral, where you so, spoke so evocatively and passionately about race. Was it the murder of George Floyd that triggered this off? Or has that been something that's been bubbling under the surface, Michael, for you? No, well, that has been going on in my mind for many, many years, Rajdeep. Um, I think the murder of George Floyd has brought it to the surface for a lot of other people. And that created what we saw on the streets all over the world. And I'm glad that this has now gone beyond just ordinary people thinking about this and deciding that it just can't continue. I'm glad that it's not just black faces or people of color that we are seeing on the streets and people demonstrating and saying en enough is enough. Because, you know, we have to come to a point where we say we need change. We can't just keep on living like this where you have abuses and people demonstrate for a day or two and then things go back to what it was before and we just keep on moving on. And I was given the opportunity by Sky to express my opinion. I don't just go out and tell people what I think all the time, but I was given the opportunity by Sky to express my opinion. And if you ask me a question, I'm going to answer that question. But you know, somewhere, you know, one sense that it was extremely deeply personal. You spoke about your parents, uh, you know, you spoke about how race had affected you because from the outside, let me be very honest, Michael, we saw India uh, we in India saw the West Indies in the 1970s and 80s as this powerful cricket team. Uh, somehow we never saw it through the prism of race. But you seem to suggest that racism was institutionalized then as it is now. And in a way, sports is no exception. No, well, sports is a part of the society in Arashdeep. And if you live, on, live in a society that has institutionalized racism, and it, it will affect sport. You can't separate one from the other. And you keep on hearing people say politics and sport should not intertwine. They are. It doesn't matter what you think and what you would like to suggest and what you think is ideal, but they are. And I went as far as to, to talk to somebody in a sporting organization recently who asked me to get involved in their sporting organization to try and see how they could get more diversified. And I said to them, listen, I hope you recognize that when I spoke, I did not mention any sport, neither cricket, nor football, nor golf, nor any sport whatsoever, because I'm interested in seeing the societal change that is needed. The people who play sport, the people who go and cheer at sport, the fans, they come from the society. If the society is cleansed and we have a nice society where everybody believes that we are all equal, we don't need to fix our sports. It is fine for people to say within their sport, this is my little area, and I want to try and fix my little area, but we have to go beyond that. And I made the example of apartheid South Africa. If during apartheid South Africa, the Af South African government had decided, okay, we let everyone play sport. All everyone in South Africa, they can go and play sport. But when they finish playing that game, they then still have to go back into society which practices apartheid. Where do they stand? They get nowhere. But, you know, when I was listening to you, you, you broke down in between. You know, you, you're certainly, you're sort of, you choked for a moment. Was that, in a way, remembering what you'd gone through in any way? Or was that just what you'd seen across all these years around you? Rajdeep, I didn't go through a lot of racism. You know. I, I encountered it, obviously. But as I said then, and I keep telling people, what I did then was to just brush it aside. I just said to myself, these people have a problem. I don't have that problem. I will live my life, let them live theirs. But then it became more and more. And as I said, I, when I started to come to England on a more regular basis, 
and I started to interact with West Indians who lived in England, and they told me what they went through on a daily basis. I couldn't then just keep on brushing it aside because these people are people that I know, people are, these people are my friends. I can't turn my back on things like that. And that is why I had it in me for, my, for so many years. My parents went through that. When my mother got married to, to my father, her family, not everybody, because our siblings this, this, did not disown her, but parts of her family decided that she was marrying a man that was too dark and they, were, they wouldn't have anything to do with her. But that just made her more determined to make her family and our life and our marriage work. And I can tell you, we had a wonderful family. We had a wonderful life because of the, the fight that my parents put up together to make sure that we were okay. You know, what Michael struck me was when you spoke about the need to educate people. And it was not just, you said, speak about educating black, white, dare I say brown, that history so far has been written by the conquerors and that, in a sense, has built an element of prejudice. As you asked, why is Jesus' image always shown as pale skin, blonde hair with blue eyes? Do you see that education at the end of the day is the real solution to this sort of dehumanization of the black people and this brainwashing, as you called it, that continues to take place around us? That's the only way, Rajdi, that's the only way this thing is going to change when we educate the people. This world was built upon white supremacy, meaning that white was always good, white was always right, and the brainwashing that took place of both people of color and white people has sustained that over centuries. And until we educate the people and let the people know that everyone has equal brain power, because you hear, you hear people saying it, everyone has equal everything within their genetics, and black people have done so many great things in the past that have been hidden because they do not want people to recognize that everyone can be equal. Until we can educate the people about all that, it will not change. When I made the example of the light bulb, who knows anything else about what Thomas Edison? But the light bulb that Thomas Edison invented could not have lasted. The carbon filament invented by a black man is why we have light shining continuously now otherwise you'd have to change that bulb every five minutes and there are so many other great black inventors that have been hidden from society because it does not fit the narrative of superiority over blacks or over people of color you know i i hadn't heard i must confess of louis latimer so obviously we were also taught poorly in school everybody the white folks have not had, had heard of him either because it did not fit the narrative, Rajdi, and that's what I'm talking about. It's not that it was kept from people of color. It was kept from everyone because the people in power did not want things like that to be coming out because it just did not fit the narrative. But, you know, there are those, Michael, I keep hearing who say that the Black Lives Movement in its own way will be divisive. Will it actually isolate white supremacists or actually, in a way, Pit white against black in some way. Is that a worry that you have that the reality on the ground may not change? I don't know about the Black Lives Movement organization because people tell me that, you know, if you go on the website, you see different things that can be contradictory. I don't care about the Black Lives Movement organization itself. I am not trying to study what they are doing. I'm trying to make people aware of the fact that we are all just people. If people not of color cannot deal with the fact that they are equal to people of color, well, there is a problem. If they understand that we are all the same, it's fine. I don't expect this thing, Ranjeep, to end today, nor tomorrow. This thing has been going on for centuries. People have privileges that they will not want to give up because they see that privilege has given them superiority. No one wants to give up superiority, that privilege that they have, whether it's real or imaginary. They don't want to give it up. No king is going to take a crown off his own head. So I don't expect this thing to just happen overnight. But as people learn, because education, as I said, is the greatest thing ever. 
as people learn and they will understand, then I expect to see a change down the road. You know, because I now hear slogans saying all lives matter. Because I might not be around to see it. No, I'm sure you'll be around, Michael, to see it because they talk about all lives matter. You know, I hear people saying, don't just single out black lives matter, all lives matter. And all lives do matter. But there's a lot of evidence to suggest that white lives matter. I don't see a great deal of evidence to show me that people of color, their lives matter. You know, it's interesting in a way, Michael, that this movement, if I may call it, that has got so many people talking about it. You've spoken out. Makaya Antini, the South African fast bowler, has gone on record saying he felt shunned as a black man in the South African dressing room. Others, like the South African captain Duplessis, now admit they could have done more. Is this kind of a cathartic moment for you and others to finally get all this out of your system in a way? I would hope so. I would hope this is waking people up because I have had a lot of friends, all different shades and colors, that have come to me and have said to me, Mikey, until you spoke, we didn't even look at it. They just continued living their lives because they just live their lives to what they're accustomed to living their lives as. And I would hope that people sit down and analyze what is really going on because I haven't heard anybody contradict what I've said yet. So that means they have accepted that what I've said is real. So let us sit down and accept that it is real and say, okay, let us try and do something about it. But as I said, you'll have a lot of people, Rajdeep, that will not want to do anything about it because they have this privilege that in their minds, they don't want to get rid of. So that will happen. It's, it's like in society, it doesn't matter how great a society you have, you'll always have crime. It doesn't matter how great a society you'll have, you'll always have some people that will be racist. But the less of them you have, the better your society will be and the more developed your society will be. But can I ask you this, that when you were playing for Derbyshire, when you were playing for that mighty West Indian team, did you feel it on the field? Did you ever face it? Did you ever feel that you were a bit discriminated Never. because of the color of your skin? No one ever passed a, a racist remark to me on a cricket field. There was always tension in the society in where that you are in. There was always some feeling, whether you're in Australia or whether you're in, in, in England, that there's always some tension there but i've never been heard somebody on a cricket field pass a remark a racist remark towards me or against me but i've been interesting first time because I've been, uh you know no sir you know, well, because michael i wanted to in a way link your own cricket journey to this entire issue of race you went to the west indies i'm uh, sorry england in 1976, as a 22-year-old fast bowler and just ahead of the tour, famously Tony Gregg said that he was going to make the West Indians grovel. Remember that? That rather yep. unfortunate remark with racist uh, overtones. And you ended that tour by destroying the West Indies with 14 wickets in that last test at the Oval, including, I think, Gregg, clean bowled, yorked by you. I was just wondering whether that word grovel, in a sense, sort of, was a spur to take revenge in some war? Was it seen as a sort of racist uh, slur in a way? The entire team, when they heard that remark from Tony Gregg, Gre had their backs up because the history of Tony Gregg made people think he's being racist because he's South African or South African background. And making a remark like that, everybody in the West Indies team who did not know him at all, Few people might have played against him in country, but still didn't know him. But this man is bringing his racist South African attitude to the series. So we had our backs up. It wasn't until much later on, I got to know Tony Gregg personally. I got to know his family, that I know that he was not a racist. He himself apologized for making that specific word or using that specific word, rubble. And if you remember, the last test match at the Oval, when the West Indies declared their second innings and England had to go out and bat again, the, a lot of the West Indians in the crowd shouted, Gravel, Greggy, Gravel, Gravel, Greggy, Gravel, Gravel. And he went down on his hands and knees the last few steps to get off the field to go into the pavilion. Now, if he was a racist and he was so adamant that black people were below him, 
he would not have done that. There's no way he would have done that. But because of his background and the use of that word, everybody just got it in their head. Because, you know, presumably you and he shared a com box. So I'm just wondering in common. Many times. Other, Many and, times. And did, he ever, Many did times. he ever apologize and say, look, I should have never said that? Did he even personally apologize to you? No, he didn't personally apologize to me, but he apologized to the entire world. He said it publicly. And we didn't just share a com, com box, you know. <laughs> I had dinner with Tony Gregg on many occasions. Yeah, I, I have been to his house, or I had been to his house. Unfortunately, he's not no longer with us. So, as I said, later on in life, when you get to know people, people will cast aspersions on certain things, but without actually knowing. And when I got to know Tony Gregg personally, I got to realize that he just made a sad mistake. You know, in that entire decade of West Indian dominance, you said you've never, there was no racist slur ever passed or a feeling of discrimination while you were on the field. But do you think, in a sense, that there was an element of black power that was in the air at the time? You know, this was the generation of Muhammad Ali. We'd had the black power in 1968 at the Mexico Olympics. Was there a point that the West Indians wanted to prove to the world that, look, we're good enough, we're better than you? Do you think that entire late 60s 70s was part of this real assertion in a way of black power in which i don't know whether ali was a great sort of hero for you growing up but you know he shaped a lot of minds i know in that generation yes for sure but gradually we wanted to assert our superiority over everyone not just england or australia we played india we wanted to beat india but we played pakistan we wanted to beat them but whoever we played against we wanted to beat them because we wanted to show the entire world that we were the superior team, not the superior race, the superior team. Because West Indies teams have had Indians in, in that team. We have had Caucasians, as people like to refer to people, because we have had people of Portuguese background, Larry Gomes. We have had people from all walks of life playing for the West Indies and officiating. We had a, a Chinese gentleman as a, as a umpire, Douglas Sang Yu, great umpire. So we just wanted to show the world that we from the Caribbean, we West Indian people, 5 million people, we could defeat any and everyone. You know, it's interesting because there was a backdrop to West Indian cricket itself. And, you know, it's the great CLR James, the historian, writes about it in Beyond the Boundary, you know, making Sir Frank Worrell the captain of the West Indies. The first black captain of West Indies was not easy because it came with the baggage of the past, you know. So it wasn't, there was a history even within the West Indies of a division on the grounds of color definitely I, I i made reference in in on sky as well when i was a young man growing up our gentleman that lived at the top of my road mr evan blake who went down to the Mer merkel bank hotel which was all whites whether they were jamaican whites or expats wh whites who went to that hotel and he jumped into the pool and everybody jumped out they called the police got him out of the out of the, the pool they drained the pool before any other person went back in it so it's a part of the Caribbean. Remember, the Caribbean was colonized at one point. A lot of the islands now, almost all the islands now, have gained their independence. Yeah, I put independence in quotations. But it is a part of history throughout the Caribbean. It is a part of history throughout Africa. Because Africa, if you know about the history of Africa, Africa was divided up amongst the European countries. They had a meeting in Berlin. In the late in the late 19th century to decide how they were going to divide up africa what would france get what would britain get what would germany take what would belgium take so this thing goes back many many years goes back centuries but as time moves on you move through different phases they get rid of certain laws that were in place but those laws disappearing doesn't mean everything disappears from the mind and that's what we now need to tackle. This is what we need to tackle now. You know, because, uh, again, you say that the West Indian team of that time wanted to prove that they were the best in the world. It wasn't about race. But, you know, one got a sense, particularly with your great friend, Sir Viv Richards, you know, he wore, wore the Rastafarian uh, uh, sort of logos on his uh, hand. And in a way, it seemed an assertion of black power. You don't agree with that. It wasn't about that. It wasn't sort of part of that, as I said, Ali... 68 Mexico at uh, you know uh, generation of American athletes who wanted to show look we're as equal as you are. Yes, but it 
you could say black power to a degree yes because the majority of the team were black but uh, but we didn't go around preaching black power and supporting black power movements and that sort of a thing we wanted to show the world how good we were it was just a fact that we were black the majority of the team was black but we didn't go around with black gloves marching and but we supported that sort of thing you see in the caribbean we did not have the oppression that i see that's even going on right now in the united states of america we didn't have that in the caribbean in my lifetime maybe it took place in the 40s 30s 40s 50s by the time i got to know exactly what was happening in jamaica it started to disappear to some degree there will always be some amount of racism and there will always be some amount of classism because that's a serious problem as well but the more education people get the more it will disappear and that is my argument you know you've mentioned a couple of times already about south africa and apartheid uh, you know i'm just wondering whether there was ever a temptation on for you also to travel to South Africa in that period of apartheid. A lot of your colleagues from the West Indies, Lawrence Rowe, Alvin Kalicharan, did go and participate in rebel tours. Uh, you know, what was your attitude when you were offered perhaps to go to South Africa and play in that apartheid period in the 70s and 80s? Wasn't interested, Rajdeep. I, I could not go out and support the apartheid regime in South Africa. You know, I believe in everybody being equal. Whether you are black, white, brown, green, pink, we are all equal human beings. I cannot support any regime, any government that's going to tell me one man is more superior to the other. Not because of the color of your skin. Because of your intellect, perhaps. Because of your skill, perhaps. But not because of the color of your skin. Because, you know, you, you do go now and commentate a lot in South Africa. Do you see still some scars of that entire period? of racism still in the country. We hear, for example, time from, uh, from time to time, murmurs of dissent over the way cricket is organized, that the South African board says you've got to have a certain number of non-white cricketers, and that leads to some kind of division cleavages. Do you still see that in a way? Definitely. It will take a long time for that to fade away. You know, slavery was abolished in 1833 by British colonies, 1865 in America. That's a long, long time ago, Rajdi. And the, everyone hasn't gotten over it yet. The apartheid regime ended officially 1994. As far as I'm concerned, South Africa is a very young country. It will take a long time for that playing field to be leveled and for everyone to be on equal footing. A very long time. That I am sure I won't live to see. But things are changing. And when things happen for centuries, you cannot expect change in a couple of years or even a decade. It takes some time. I know people in South Africa, they think it is too slow. But I would advise them that unless they are young people, they should not just expect total change in their lifetime. World, this world is not about everything happening in your lifetime. It's about putting things in place to make the world a better place, even after you're gone. There's a saying, Rajiv, I have a lot of sayings on my phone. There's one particular saying. Great men plant trees whose shade they know they'll never benefit from. You don't just plant a tree because in two years' time you want to sit under the tree and get the shade. You plant a tree for, for future generations, and that is what people have to think about putting things in place for the future. It's not just for you and for immediate effect. You know, because uh, do you believe that therefore this policy of having a certain number of cricketers who are non-whites is a good one? Or do you believe a cricket team should be chosen purely on merit? Irrespective of color, choose the 11 best cricketers for a country like South Africa. If you're going to do that, if you're going to have that principle that you choose a team purely on merit, you'll have to have equal opportunity for everyone in the country to get to that level. They have put that in place, in my opinion, they have put that in place because they know that everyone in that country did not, still does not have equal opportunity to get into the highest level.
So they are trying to live the play playing field almost artificially. I am sure eventually that playing field will be so level that they have to have no artificial things in place. Right now, Rajdeep, I won't, won't tell you I know everything about South Africa, but I've been going there for the last seven years, and I don't just go there to, to, to do commentary and watch cricket and go home. I try to learn when I go to countries. Right now, I see special schools in South Africa that are the feeding ground into South African test team and the, the higher order of South African cricket. That needs to change. They need to get to a point where you can go to any school, come from any community and have almost equal. And I say almost because I know it's impossible for everybody to have equal opportunity. But the opportunities have got to be spread a lot further than that. What they are doing is going and picking people. Oh, that kid looks like he has talent. Let's send him to the school or that organization. No, you have got to make sure there are other kids in that general facility, that general community that have opportunities except for that one kid that you have picked out. Makaya in Tini, he was picked out of a village. But if somebody hadn't seen him in that village, he would have just, he would not, not have existed as far as South African cricket is concerned. But if there was cricket organized in the village or in the general area where a lot of the kids around there could go and play, it would be a different matter. And that is where you need to get to. We had a similar yeah. problem in Jamaica. Jamaica, when we were picking the Jamaica team years ago, mm -hmm. the Jamaica team was picked from the, cl the clubs in Kingston. Kingston and Central were mainly because those were the clubs that played senior cup cricket, so they were easily spotted. As soon as we started to spread the net far and wide to all the different parishes around Jamaica, there were so many good cricketers that were discovered in all these parishes that nobody knew about, nobody saw them because they did not play in the senior cup competition in, in Kingston. And that is with the direction in which everything has to go. You know, in, in, in a sense, this is true of India also, Michael, because, you know, for a long time, Indian sport was largely centered around the big cities, the Mumbai's, the Delhi's. Today, it's spread across the country. You know, the democrat what I call the democratization of sport. You know, today, most of the young Indian cricketers are coming from small towns. So what you are saying is, at the end of the day, even beyond race, it's about equal opportunity. Provide exactly. equal opportunity, equal facilities, and allow the merit, you know, merit will automatically find its way, presumably. Well, all you can do, Rajdeep, is give someone opportunity. Not everyone will take that opportunity. But if they don't have it to take, they will get nowhere. It's up to them to take the opportunity and to better themselves and to do whatever they are capable of doing. If they do not get the opportunity, you'll never know what is possible. You know, you, you spend a lot of time in England as well. A country which, again, has had a tortured, difficult past with racism. Do you see that also on the sports field? Because again, from the outside, I see more and more uh, uh, non-white cricketers or non-white footballers now making it to the top in England. Is that also changing in a way? Yes, but they are making it to the, making it to the top, but they're, they're still complaining about the racist abuse that they do get. And that is what I'm talking about, Rajdi. It is fine to say football is diversified or cricket is or tennis or whatever it is. But when they go back into the society and when the fans turn up at the different venues and racially abuse them, how does that make them feel? You have got to get the society sorted, not just the individual sports. So you're As saying said, even Britain today is it may be diverse in sport, but it's not diverse outside the sport. That's what you're saying. It still has not been able to embrace true diversity. No, definitely not. I was just reading today an article where a lot of past MPs and some past political leaders here in England are suggesting that the curriculum in schools be changed to teach a lot about people of color, the greatness that the people of color have done. And I understand it has been rejected by the government. So <laughs> where are we going? No, but 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 Michael, when a Jofra Archer, Jamaican born, bowls England to win the last born. over of that World Cup final, doesn't that melt boundaries? Is is Barbados born, by the way, not 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 Jamaica? Barbados born, Barbados. I mean, why yes. is it that I think of fast bowling and I think of Jamaica? Barbados born, Jofra Archer. Yes. 
You say he, he, him both Bells Mountains, of course, all England were proud of him. Proud of the fact that he won, he helped to win the world the World Cup for England. But what happens afterwards? He goes out and he gets abusive messages through his his social media accounts and that sort of thing. If everyone was proud and happy to be a part of it, they would not then go and abuse him on social media. Could that be a fringe group which always has existed or do you believe it still is mainstream, this sort of, uh, you know, uh, the, the lack of diversity in, in, pub, in society is still mainstream or are these fringe elements who will use social media as a lynch mob or do you believe it's, it's out there? Have, I mean, is it in the heart of society in a way still? I think it's, I wouldn't call it fringe because fringe would, would almost suggest that it has no effect. It has, you can cut it off. And I wouldn't say it's in the heart of society. I would not say the majority of people think that way, but there's still a large number that think that way. And until we can keep on reducing that number, we will continue to struggle. Look at the example I just gave you about the government refusing or a minister of government refusing to adopt the principle of open teaching, teaching everything. I would hope that people keep on insisting because I understand it was a letter signed by many, many people that was sent in to the government. I would hope that people keep insisting and keep on banging on that door because that door has to open at some point. Because, you know, in India, for example, you toured India in 84. Did you ever feel in India at any level any sense of discrimination? We heard Darren Sammy, your former West Indian captain, the other day suggest he appeared to have been made fun of for his skin color by his teammates when he was playing for Hyderabad in the IPL. Did you ever sense that, that India, uh, did you ever feel any sense of discrimination at all? Not color discrimination. I, I never felt that in India. As a matter of fact, the West Indies team I played for, whenever we toured India, we had, we had to be hiding from the public because they adored us so much. <laughs> the fan base was so huge. But certainly, I can't remember any West Indies member going down to India and, and thinking that they were discriminated against. You know, we hear a lot of things in the Indian society amongst Indians with the caste system and that sort of a thing. But I don't know of any West Indies cricketer that could say or would say that they went to India or Pakistan or Sri Lanka or anywhere like that and felt that as if they were discriminated against. Well, I tell you, we have caste and, and color discrimination at one level in this country also. So, I mean, while we've had a political reflection of that and anger against that, but it does exist. But uh, yeah, well, no, cricketers no. are beyond all that. Yeah, we well, just well, have a slice of you. Yeah. Well, I, I know I know the color thing exists in India, you know, Rajdeep, because every time I go there and watch the television, I see these advertisements for these creams to make your skin lighter. And it's a billion dollar industry. And again, that's, right, that's, that's brainwashing for people being brainwashed to believe the lighter your skin is, the better a person you are. It's that's difficult right. to get that slow, brainwashing. That's also slowly changing, but only very slowly. Suddenly, the advertisement companies are realizing that you can't have these advertisements. But trust me, it still exists. You'll get classified ads, wanted a bride fair looking. So for being fair is still a, you know, is, is still a factor yep. that prejudice does exist. And it will exist for a long time until people, as I said, get educated. We, we, we had a great artist in Jamaica. Bob Marley, I'm sure yes. you have heard of him. Bob Marley, you used to put it in his song. He's my, he's my favorite Jamaican, you're number two. <laughs> Thank you. But yes. Bob Marley sang about those, these things. Here. Emancipate That's yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. A lot of people listen to Bob Marley's music and all they do is dance to it and they like the rhythm. They don't listen to the words. They don't listen to what the man is saying. He had another song he took from a speech of his imperial majesty Hale Selassie about war, he labeled it war and talking about until the color of a man's skin is no more significant than the color of his eyes there will be war. People just dance and they listen to the rhythm, they don't listen to the words and people need to listen and understand and to learn. You have a favorite Bob Marley song? 
There are too many of them, Rajdeep. There are too <laughs> many. He, had, he was I a great. Buffalo, I, I'm, I'm a Buffalo soldier, man. Buffalo soldier, I use that to describe Virat Kohli. <laughs> I see why. Well, well, you, you see him as a Buffalo he, soldier. Definitely. Definitely. You know, that's a good point in which to turn to sort of cricketing matters up. You know, let, let me ask you the greatest batsman that you bowl to. Rajiv, when people ask me those things, I, I can't answer them because I played against so many great players. I try to identify one or two from each country. I, I, I can't pick one. And so I go through country by country and talk about the great players I played against. It's difficult to select one out of so many great players when I played in the 70s and 80s. So, so pick two Indians. Two Indians, maybe contemporary or in your time, that you feel you know, you'd always pay to watch. Well, Sunil Gabaska in my time, you know, and this is not just because we are great friends. <laughs> Sunil Gabaska was a great batsman. He, he in my time, and of course, the gentleman I just mentioned, I'll pay to watch Virat Kohli bat right now. Uh, you, you don't want to get into the Virat versus Sachin comparison, do you? No, I don't want to get into that at all. I want to be friends with everybody. I'll get a, I'll get a headline suddenly. Michael says, Virat, better player than Sachin and Gavaska. Uh, but look, they're all great, uh, I'm sure. Definitely. Uh, That's why I can't pick one of anywhere. Uh, you can't pick one. Okay, fair enough. But you mentioned Gavaska. Your favorite teammate, because that was, you know, this constellation of West Indian greats who came together. It's unbelievable, particularly the fast bowlers. Do you have a favorite that you have? Uh, that, that someone you love bowling with or playing with? Well, not just bowling with or playing with. I have a favorite teammate and we are still bosom buddies, Andy Roberts. Andy Roberts and myself started off pretty much at the same time. We were both 12 men for our respective islands in a domestic game in Jamaica. It was a shell shield as it was called then. He was 12 man for the combined islands. I was 12 man for Jamaica. And we sat on that bench at Sabina Park doing our duties, carrying out water, towels, whatever. And we just built a great relationship from that day until now. He was best man at my wedding, the best man at his wedding. We still talk. Every now and again, I get a call from him on WhatsApp. You know, with that relationship won't end until one of us departs. The best fast bowler you, you saw, Andy Roberts? Again, that is difficult to nominate one. He, he taught me a lot. We are we are great friends and i learned so much from him i even learn from him still now because when i would talk and he talks cricket i just see the, the brain power behind this man the cricket behind this man's head but when you think of dennis lily and malcolm marshall of that era they were great fast bowlers as well dale stain of modern era you know i have seen a lot of great fast bowlers i again i i would hesitate to pick one but you know what was it like if i may ask you know, again, from the outside, from India, we saw the four of you. At times, there were five, six. I mean, it was tough to pick four, I guess, in that West Indian team. What was it in that late 70s and 80s? Where did you all just... Was it just serendipity that you all came together at the same time? I mean, where did it all happen? Yeah, it was just a perfect storm coming together. And, you know, we had a lot of talent in the team, yes. But what also helped that team, not just the fast bowlers, but what helped that team was World Series cricket. When we went and played for Paka, we built a really family when we went and played in World Series cricket. And also, we built a strong, physically strong team by the amount of training and exercises that we did under the instructions of a gentleman by the name of Dennis Waite. That's Dennis Waite was assigned to the World Series cricket, the West Indies World Series cricket team, and he built us into a machine. And we, after World Series cricket, we just continued down the same line. You know, I, I like the use of the word machine because if it was a machine, it was more Ferrari than anything else. It was just a well-oiled machine and you were, in a way, Ferrari come Rolls Royce. But, you know, Michael, strangely enough, my favorite memory of you, and I saw you in Mumbai in 84 bowling, is actually batting. 1984. Batting. Viv Richards, 189 in that one day. You have a oh, 106 okay. run partnership. He scores 93. You make 12. Now, what was it like batting with Sir Whip? A bit dangerous at times. Because <laughs> <laughs> sometimes I couldn't afford to back up too far because sometimes the ball would be coming back towards me. I had to give myself a bit of space. 
But just batting with someone like Big Richard, you just marvel at his skills. Now you're at the non-strikers end. You have no real part to play because I had to face too many deliveries. He was so skillful. And just watching the mastery of this man, he pretty much hit the balls wherever he wanted. Sometimes you'd walk towards the outside to hit it over the onside, back away outside leg, somebody hit it over the, the offside. It just he just manipulated the entire proceedings. Wherever the field was set, he knew exactly what to do to avoid the fielders. You know, he was highly skilled. I keep telling people I haven't seen a better batsman than Ivy A. Richards, and I still haven't seen one. And you finally told us, you finally told us who's the best contemporary cricketer that you've seen over the last no, few yeah, years. You asked who I bowled against, though, Rajdeep. <laughs> <I didn't, laughs> so your favorite I, teammate is Richards. And and you're no, not gonna no, no. and you're gonna choose players from across countries out of which Gavaskar is one out of those who you bowled against, right? Well, I'll I'll but the best batsman I've seen is Bib Richards. Of okay. those that I bowled against, I couldn't pick one. There are a lot of great batsmen I have bowled against. Okay. Uh, your favorite memory playing against India? Do you have a memory? Uh, you know, uh, I presume, of course, uh, the '83 World Cup is the sort of downer. But is there a memory? Was there a World Cup in Sorry. Was there a World Cup in '83? <laughs> Did he, are you, have, have you still got over it? Viv Richards told me he still hasn't got over it. He still I wants wiped to away. replay it. Have you got over it? <laughs> Do you still sort of get nightmares about that day? No, I don't get nightmares, but I don't want to remember that game. But, you know, is there a favorite memory? Because, look, there's one dark image that we have. I won't use the word dark. There's one. There's an image that we have. Again, I fell for the brainwashing there. But there's an image that we have, which is 1976, the bloodbath, when Indian batsmen were hit all over in, in Kingston. And I know that uh, it left a lot of sort of bad blood in this country. You were accused of bowling five bounces and over beamers. That's the one time we thought, you know, Michael holding, you're crossing the line. Do you, do you have regrets about that? No beamers, Rajdeep. There was, there was no bounces. beamer hole in that, in, in that game. There were a lot of bouncers. And I went round the wicket. To make it even more difficult for the Indian batsmen, but as you, as I said earlier on, and as the Indians can attest, I have no hard feelings against them. We are great friends, Sunil Gavaskar and myself. This year it won't happen, but each year we meet up in London, have dinner together at least one, sometimes many. Jimmy Amanath, no enemies whatsoever. Anshuman Gaikwad, I didn't hit him, but he got hit in that game. He got hit in his ear. We remain great friends. Every now and again, we message each other. If he is in London, we always meet up together. So that is just an incident that took place on a cricket field. And all of us have regrets at various things that we have done at various stages of our life. But once it doesn't carry over, once it doesn't flow over. Another person I should mention, Bishen Singh Bedi. Bishan and myself are buddies. Bishan emails me every now and again. I drop him an email every now and again as well. And Bishan was very, very upset. Very, very upset in 1976 about that. I remember we arrived in England that same summer of 76. Northlands were playing Middlesex at Lords. We went there to practice. And Bishan Betty was there with the Northampton team. And Bishan didn't even look in our direction. At the, I remember it clearly. <laughs> Those things happen. You, you cannot go through life and everything is a bed of roses. You'll get stuck by a few thorns every now and again. But you have to move on from that. That is what life is all about. You know, let, let me end with where we started off. You know, you when I hear you now, you seem much more than a cricketer. There's almost a philosopher in, 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 in Michael Holding. And, uh, you know, is that how you see yourself, particularly with uh, you know, expressing your views on contentious issues like race, that you believe that sportsmen must also have a viewpoint that goes beyond the boundary. Don't judge them only by what they do on the field, but they've also got to have a voice beyond it. Rajdeep, if you came to my house, wherever I am, I'm in England at the moment now, if you came to my house in the Caribbean where I now live, you would not know that I was a cricketer. There are no cricketing pictures in any abode that I have. 
because I consider myself someone who played cricketer, not just a cricketer, who played cricket rather, not just a cricketer. And all sportsmen have got to go beyond their sport. First thing you have got to do is read. I wouldn't know half of the stuff that I know if I didn't read. I get many opportunities to read, yes, because when I'm on tour, sometimes I just buy books and I sit down and I read. You can get a lot of stuff on the internet. Now you don't need not to buy books. You can go on the internet free and read and get facts, not rumors and people expressing opinions, but facts. So it's important that you read. You got to read to learn. My sure, mother, probably, because of the fact that she was a teacher and a headmistress, inculcated that in me. So maybe I benefited a great deal from in that regard. You know, I, uh, as I said, you're number two in my Jamaican list. Uh, there's Bob Bali and there's Usain Bolt. And I sometimes yes, wonder great if you, man. Great and, man. You know, if you hadn't if you hadn't been a cricketer, you'd have been a hundred meter sprinter. No, 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 no. That that is pure rumor. I would. I, if I yeah, if I attempted that, I wouldn't have gotten very far. But you have a great tradition in your country of, of sprinting. So, uh, I mean, you know, it, it's a... Uh, what is it, Little Island, and you produce all these champion sports persons? There must be something in the air of Kingston. Not just Kingston. Throughout, throughout Jamaica. Because you see, in Bolt will tell you where he is from. He, it's all about the yellow yam. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Listen, I, I, I have to end this with a very personal thing, Michael, and it's bringing, I, it's making me, I must confess, a little emotional. Uh, my father in 71 came to the West Indies and scored a double century uh, at, at Kingston. Sabina Park. I, at Sabina Park. India was 60 for five, and he goes on to score a double century. And it's something that I think defined him in many ways, cricketing wise. But he had the most wonderful memories. He said the best rum that he ever drank was in your part of the world and he never he always remembered that he never went back to the west indies i think but so it's been special i don't know if you remember the lips are this side but of course i remember, I remember oh, when you were there at that yeah, game? In the caribbean that year definitely yeah it was a special moment the first time we beat the west Indies, and it'll be 50 years next year but i you know it's been an honor speaking to you michael i just want to say on behalf of lots of those who are watching this that You've been someone who's inspired people both on the field and off it. And uh, so thank you for all those memories. My pleasure, Rajdeep. I enjoyed it. Believe me, I enjoyed my career. And, uh, and you thank know, you for letting us, thank you for letting us win in that June day in 1983. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, well, I think you know how close West Indies and India are. So we had to give you something to boost you because after ninety eight, the eighty three World Cup, India weren't that interested in one day cricket, and as you know, one day cricket started to blossom in India. So we had to give you a little Philip to help you along the way. That's right. You gave us more than a little help to defeat the mighty West Indies. Was a turning point in Indian cricket. Look, Michael, it's been an honor, as I said again, to speak to you. And on behalf of CCFC and the Bengal Heritage Foundation, London, thank you so much for doing this. I hope that your voice and your views on on racism echo across the world and we live in the future in a much more diverse equal society uh, that's what really we would all like to see definitely so thank you very much my pleasure my pleasure is to all towards being a, having a better world thank you michael holding the one and only rolls royce as i call him of fast money thanks for watching thank you michael